Father, we consider just everything you do in our lives. Your faithfulness. Your faithfulness on the good days. Your faithfulness on the difficult days. And every day in between. And that's evidence of your goodness. It's evidence of your faithfulness. It's evidence of your love for us. And so we consider how, as Paul says in Colossians, that you hold all things together. And so we're moved to worship. We're moved to praise you. Father, considering what you have done in our lives, what you've done for us, we have no choice but to praise you, to praise the Father, to praise the Son, to praise the Spirit at work in us. And all of this works together for evidence, not just of your gifts to us, not just of your blessings to us, but Father, it's evidence of you. And so we're so grateful for that. We're grateful that you saw us and you know us and you chose to love us. And we're grateful that you still see us and you still know us and you still love us. And so, Lord, we turn back this time that you've given us this morning and we pray that it would be a sweet aroma to you. We pray that it would be a sweet sound to you. We pray that as we lay our life on the altar, as living sacrifices, Father, we don't have much, but we just come to you confessing that what we have we just want to give to you. And so Lord, move today. Lord, speak to us through your word. And Father, we will praise you and we will thank you because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a sweet reminder. Um, and if, you, if you're here this morning for the first time, if you're here for the hundredth time, I pray that what we have gotten so far from our time together is that God loves you, Amen. the gospel means something, and the only hope that you have, the only hope that I have in this life and in eternity is the hope of the gift of God's love, the gift of salvation that's given to us by God through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's all we got. I'm not going to say anything profound. Phil's not going to say anything profound. Your Sunday school leaders aren't going to say anything profound that even compares to the reality that you are loved by a holy, just, heavenly Father. And so we're thankful for that reminder this morning. We're thankful for God's grace. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to meet me in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 6. Uh, we're going to be going, uh, we're, we're in the process of walking through the Lord's Prayer, um, kind of unpacking uh, the, the petitions uh, that, that Jesus lays out in the Lord's Prayer to hopefully get uh, an idea of uh, if we can consider the logistics of prayer, uh, the expectation of prayer. Uh, I think Jesus helps us do this in the Gospel of Matthew. And so he says in verse 9 of Matthew 6, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. So here we're, uh, we're considering the fourth petition. Uh, we've worked through the, the imperative uh, to uh, what, what it looks like to make his, to, to glorify God, to make his name hallowed, to, to make much of Jesus. We've worked through uh, the ideas of your kingdom come and your will be done. Uh, this fourth petition here is a particular encouragement to me personally uh, because of what Jesus says here. He, he doesn't say, uh, what, knows what he, what he doesn't pray for. He doesn't pray, uh, give us this day our daily kale. 
uh, or give us this day our daily tofu. So uh, next time you're at Olive Garden and the server asks you, uh, would you like a fourth ba- basket of breadsticks? Just remember, we're supposed to pray for bread. Um, and I'm pretty sure that that is the correct interpretation of this passage. <laughs> Uh, uh, carbohydrates aside, uh, this, this particular passage is, uh, uh, is, is of encouragement to me. As we view prayer through the lens of what God says about prayer through the Scripture, we begin to see how prayer is not only insight uh, into our theology, but we see how prayer anchors us to the disciplines that we need in order to walk with the Lord. Consider what Paul says about prayer. He says in 1 Thessalonians, he says, pray without ceasing. Uh, He says uh, in Philippians to offer supplications uh, in everything. Uh, Prayer is to be a constant in our life. In the the big things of life and in the small things of life, Paul would say, hey, in everything, make your supplication to the Lord. Uh, I'm grateful that there's nothing so small that our Heavenly Father doesn't welcome us uh, as we approach the throne of grace uh, with these things. But Paul goes on to describe the way that we approach prayer as being steadfast in prayer. Steadfast, immovable, consistent, whatever synonym you want to place there, uh, Scripture is clear that prayer is to be a regular part of the Christian's life. In fact, prayer should be so much a part of our life that it begins to be the first place we go and the most consistent place that we stay as we seek the will of the Lord, as we work to simply be obedient. Prayer is that arena where God does business with his children because it's in prayer where we find that God continues to use his word to speak to us. God's word, uh, God communicates to us through his word. We respond back through prayer, and this communion that we have with the Heavenly Father continues as we pray to our Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit reminds us, remember the the role of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of the things that we know about God, to remind us the things that Scripture says about God. Tim Keller says this about prayer. He says, what is prayer then in its fullest sense? Prayer is continuing a conversation that God has started through His Word and his grace, which eventually becomes a full encounter with him. And so as we encounter God's word, we begin to see more clearly the character of God. We begin to see more clearly the actions of God. We begin to see him and we're reminded of the key truths about God that we need, we desperately need our lives to be anchored in. In a world where nothing is certain except for taxes and death, we need something in which to anchor that's immovable. And through prayer, through God's word and through prayer, we begin to see increasingly that that anchor is the Lord. The writer of Hebrews says that we have an anchor that is steadfast and sure, and it is the Lord. And so this is how we fight our battles. This is how we, we wage war. We wage war with the, with the Word of God, and we wage war in prayer to God. And so we come to this passage where Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread. As we consider this prayer through the lens of Scripture, through what uh, Scripture says about God, we, we look to a couple of passages to help teach us about what Jesus says here. I think one of the uh, most helpful passages is Psalms 23. Um, and so if you have your Bibles uh, and you want to navigate there, we, we probably could all quote Psalms 23. It's arguably one of the best known passages of Scripture uh, in Scripture. Uh, you don't have to be associated with a church for very long to, to hear this passage. Uh, but, but I believe that, that to help us understand this idea of give us this day our daily bread, it's helpful to see God through one of the motifs that, that Scripture often paints him in. This, this idea of, of God or Jesus as our shepherd is something that, that happens, that it, it recurs uh, uh, frequently in Scripture. Jesus says in John chapter 10 that I'm the good shepherd of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So this idea of God as our shepherd and Jesus living out, being a representation of what that means for our Heavenly Father to be a shepherd helps us understand this idea of 
God, give us this day our daily bread. And so David writes this in Psalms 23. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is a psalm of, of great comfort. Uh, this is a psalm of, of great imagery. David has a way uh, with words, not because he knows about being a shepherd, but because he, he was one. Uh, that, that was his profession before he came to fame by being a giant slayer and being a king. And so uh, as David writes this, he writes not from the perspective of someone who knows about being a shepherd, but he writes as someone who has lived in the field with his sheep. As someone who we know from his experience, his, his testimony, uh, if you will, that uh, that his experience as a shepherd caused him to fight lions and bears. Um, David, was, David was a bad dude. Like, you don't mess with David. So David was writing this from the standpoint of he lived, he lived this life. And so he would understand if he heard Jesus' statement here, give us this day our daily bread, uh, I've, I've got to believe that David, at least at some point, his mind would go to, well, what does it look like for God to be our shepherd? What did it look like for me to be a shepherd and provide for my sheep? I think there's some disciplines here that, that we have to consider as we consider the Lord's Prayer and as we consider this prayer through the lens of God as our shepherd king. God is the one who provides for us. One, we, we are to develop a discipline of dependence on our Heavenly Father. In a world where uh, it, it's not uh, uh, an esteemed value to be dependent on anybody. Like we, we, we hear culture, culture would tell us, hey, you need to get ahead. You need to, you need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You need, to, you need to be the provider of your family. You need to be the breadwinner. You need to be the one that's the problem solver in your own life. And this idea of dependence is one that, that's often looked at as a sign of weakness. But, but remember... Months ago, as we talked about the, the Beatitudes, that, that this kingdom that Jesus was ushering in was, was flipped upside down compared to the kingdom of this world, that, that what Jesus would encourage us to do is to be dependent. And so Jesus says this. He says, give us, as we pray, we were to pray for our Heavenly Father to give us our daily bread. He is the provider for what we need. Scripture tells us time and time again, Psalms 34.10, young lions lack food and go hunger, but those who seek the Lord will not lack anything uh, good. Philippians 4.19, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Let's, let's make it distinctive here. We're not saying that we're preaching the prosperity gospel. You will never hear us say, if you sow a seed of $1,000, the, the Lord will respond and give you 10000 that's flawed theology. What God asks of us is that we give everything. We deny ourselves. We, we doubt ourselves. That we give everything. And what he promises to do is to be our good shepherd. That may not, he may not give us everything that we want, but he meets our needs. He meets our needs, not our greeds. And so there's theology at work today that I think is, is insidious that would say that, that God works in such a way that his purpose is to be your cosmic vending machine. If you press the right buttons, if you say the right thing, then he'll give you what you want. And that theology has caused a lot of people ruin because whenever, whenever they jump through whatever hoops that they're told to jump through and he doesn't answer the way that that they think he's supposed to answer, then that, that calls into question God's faithfulness whenever God never promised to give us everything that we want, but he promised that because he's our shepherd, we will not lack. And so he's the provider that provides for what we need. 
Prayer then is a reminder of our dependence on God. Just like a child needs their parent. We need God. And so David would say that, that the Lord is the provider. The Lord is our shepherd. He's the one that faithfully provides. He leads us. He restores our souls. He renews us. God is faithful to do that. And so therefore, our response is to confess one thing and to profess one thing. We're to confess that we are not the solution in our life. We are not the king. We are not the shepherd. You're not the answer to your own prayers. But we're to profess that Jesus is. If he's our shepherd, if he's the good shepherd, if he knows the sheep, if he's the one that provides, then, then what that calls us to do is to, to, to develop a discipline of simply confessing that we need him. And that's a good prayer to pray. You maybe think, if, if, you're, if you ever think, I just don't know how to pray. Man, a good prayer is, Lord, I need you. Amen. Lord, be with me. I need you. I can't, but you can. That's his character. He's our good shepherd. And because he's our good shepherd, we lack nothing. We lack nothing that we need for his glory. Secondly, the, other, the, the next discipline is we acknowledge the moment-by-moment moment faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. Notice uh, what, David, what David says here. He says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What David would describe is a, a very active approach that our shepherd has in our lives. Now, there's, there's not a day that goes by that, that God's ever like, I, I, need, I just need, I need a personal health day. So you do you for a day and I'm gonna do me and, and I'll, I'll get back with you tomorrow. Like he never, he never says that, he never does that. But he actively leads, he actively guides, he actively restores. And so we acknowledge the moment by moment faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. D David says some things here that, that I think are, are, are pretty interesting whenever you consider the context with which he says it. Like Whenever I was growing up, I, I would read this, this verse, verse number two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And growing up in Tennessee, like we had pastures everywhere. We had rolling meadows, we had green fields, so I, I, kind, of, I kind of understood what that looked like, or, or so I thought. But remember, the context of Psalms 23 is from a shepherd boy who shepherded in Israel. I don't know if you've, you've had a chance to, to visit Israel in the past, but there's not a lot of rain happening there. And in fact, the rainy season is about 60 days. So, so let's, let's think logically about this for, for just a moment. If David is equivocating God as our good shepherd who leads us to green pastures, who makes us lie down in green pastures, then his experience would have been that he, he would know what the green lush pastures are for maybe 60 days of the year. But what about the other, well, how, many, how many days are in a, in a year? What about the other 305? Is that right? 405, 305? Now, I'm not, I know how many days are in a year. But what, what about the other 305 days? What about the other nine months? If, you, if you've seen pictures of, of grazing paths in, in Israel, that it would be easy to, to assume, okay, do these, do these sheep, do they eat rocks? What, what's going on here? You, you see, that there are, there are times in David's experience that he would have been able to lead his sheep to fields that were green like we think they are. But then there were times where he was having to lead his sheep to desperately try to find grass. And sometimes the grass that he would have to find was not as green as we would like for it to be. But the role of the shepherd was to always keep the sheep moving and to give the sheep just what they need just when they needed it. But the truth is the same here regardless of those circumstances, that the good shepherd is still leading, is still making them lie down, is still restoring our soul, is still leading in the paths of righteousness. And so the shepherd would constantly be moving from place to place to graze his herds. Whether they were 
finding just a little bit of grass just for a few moments, or they were able to dwell there for quite a while. And that picture is a good representation of the Christian life. Because we consider our good shepherd, and it's easy to consider his leadership and his faithfulness and his provision whenever things are good. But what about whenever we experience the difficult times? What, what about when it, we experience the, the seasons where the green pastures aren't so green? Maybe our finances have taken a hit. Maybe our family, is there's some tension and strife there. Maybe, maybe our walk, maybe we just feel dry. Have you ever felt just, just dry? You're in a dry area spiritually. And the truth that we can root our lives to is this truth that whether we feel intimately close with God or whether we feel like we're a million miles away, that what our good shepherd is doing is he's still leading. He is still faithful. He's still giving us comfort. This is why Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 and 23 are so important to us. Scripture says, because of the Lord's faithfulness, we don't perish, for his mercies never end. They are new every morning. So regardless of what your pasture looks like today, regardless of what your walk looks like today, God's mercies are new. God gives you the grace that you need for the day, regardless of what that day looks like. You know, there's a, a saying that rabbis used to say, they may still say it, in conjunction with, with this passage. They'd often say that worry is dealing with tomorrow's problems on today's grass. But as, as we pray this prayer of need, as we exercise this discipline of dependence, we see that God gives us just what we need just when we need it. It may not be bread for the next month, but it's always going to be bread for today. Think of the children of Israel in the wilderness, the manna. Remember the instruction with the manna? Get just what you need for today. Don't plan for tomorrow. Don't, don't store up the manna. Because the lesson here that God was wanting to teach his people was that even in the midst of their wandering, even in the midst of the desert, they were in the desert too that God was faithful to provide what they needed today. So therefore we pray, God, give us this day our daily bread. And so we ask the question, what then is our daily bread? I mean, it's, it's, it might be breadsticks from Olive Garden, but it's so much more than that. Our, our last discipline here is that we rest in the faithful provision of our Heavenly Father, our daily bread can be physical, uh, the meeting of physical needs. But notice again what David says here in Psalms 23. He says, He makes me lie in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. I've never been around sheep a lot. A couple of county fairs, visited a couple of farms. I don't hang out with sheep. But I I know a little bit about sheep. I know what people say about sheep that, have, that hang out with sheep a lot. And they're anxious animals. And I know that one of the things that shepherds would, would have to do if, if a stream is running too quickly, they would have to uh, build a little offshoot of the stream so that there would literally be still water so that the sheep would, would drink. Otherwise, they're too anxious to. They, they won't sit still long enough to get the nourishment that they need. They want to sit still long enough to know that, hey, if I don't drink, I'm going to die. They want to sit still long enough to, to realize that they're being led by the shepherd. Does this sound like anybody to you? In a world where we don't sit still, in a world where the enemy would love to make us so busy that we feel like we don't have time to pray, he would make us feel like we're so busy we don't have time to to, to consume his word, the word of God. In a world where anxiety is something that affects seemingly each and every one of us, our good shepherd is working in such a way that he, he leads us to still waters, meaning that the anxiety of life, 
he deals with. He says this in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear. He goes on to say that, man, e even the, the ravens, the, the birds, the, the, they, don't, they don't farm. You don't see a, a, a bird gathering into, into a storehouse and, and saying, well, it's, it's, it's gathering season, so we'll, we'll get ready for the winter. They're, they're just doing what they do. And Jesus says, your heavenly Father provides for them. He says, consider the lilies of the field. They don't sew their own clothes. They're not going to Belk and finding the best deals. They're not going to teach that. Like, they don't work to, to clothe themselves. But whenever they're in bloom, man, even Solomon and all his money and all his clothes can't compare to what they look like. Your heavenly Father takes care for them. And Jesus makes this point. If he does that, for the birds of the air, if he does that for the lilies of the field, how much more is he going to do for you? Because you are of value to him. You're of so much value that he not only clothes you, he not only feeds you, but he sent his only son to die for you to make right everything that is wrong in your heart, to make right the sin that plagues us. And so Jesus would say that we rest in that provision, our daily bread, yes, it's physical need, <coughs> But more importantly, it's spiritual need. We have a Heavenly Father that knows not only what we need, but He knows how to minister to our souls. David goes on to say He's the restorer of our soul. He gives us comfort. He fights for us. Scripture says He fights for us. He walks with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. The fact that the King of kings and the Lord of lords chooses to minister to my soul like, think about this. My shepherd king, the one who made heaven and earth, the one who holds all things together, he restores my soul. He restores your soul. So therefore, we can say, we can ask this question that the writer of Hebrews chapter 13 says. He says, the Lord is my helper. I'm not going to be afraid. What can man do to me? If we have a heavenly father who is the restorer of our soul, if he leads us beside still waters, if he makes me lie down, if he leads me in this way, this perfect shepherd, what do I have to be afraid of? What do I have to fear? Not if God's on my side, but if I'm on God's side. What do I have to fear if Jesus holds me? That's, a, that's another part of, of his shepherdship in John chapter 10. Jesus talks about, man, I, I hold them in my hand. Whoever, my, my sheep, the ones who, who are mine, I hold them in my hand. And my father, he holds them in his hand. <clears throat> so what do we have to fear? What do we have to be afraid of? Even when verse 4 comes. David says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. This begs a good question. If the relationship with our shepherd causes us not to want, if we pray to God, give us this day our daily bread, how do we reconcile situations like verse 4 of Psalms 23? Well, I think we see some insights there in the way David words this poem. Because you see, the valleys are a glorious time of intimacy. David changes the, the grammatical structure of this poem to, instead of talking about our, our shepherd king as he makes me lie down, he leads me beside the still waters, he restores my soul. Notice what he says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they come for me. You prepare a table before me. You see, the shepherd rarely leads from fence to fence here. Rarely do we say, okay, I see the destination. It's a straight line. Let's go. I'm going to follow. The shepherd rarely leads like that. Oftentimes, the, the, the path that he leads us on is full of, of valleys. It's full of hardship. And, and this is not something new. Your trial is not something new. Your trial is not something that's never happened before in, God, in the history of God working with his people. 
Your trial is something that he is uber equipped to deal with. Your trial is something that God is capable of dealing with because over and over and over and over in Scripture, we see the example of God's people going through difficult things and the only thing that's steadfast, the only thing that doesn't change is God is with them. You look at Joseph, man, his story God was still his good shepherd whenever he was interpreting dreams for the king. And he was still his good shepherd when he was forgotten in the pit. Whenever he was forgotten in prison, whenever he was lied about. Man, Daniel, man, God was still his good shepherd when he he was interpreting dreams for the king. When he was leading, God was still his good shepherd when he was in the pit with the lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God was still the good shepherd in the middle of the fiery furnace. David, God was still his good shepherd when he was a murderous adulterer. That didn't change. So we look at this. We look at this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. We look at it through the lens of who God is, what Scripture says about us. Scripture is rich with instance after instance of God's faithfulness, of his provision, of how exactly he's our good shepherd. It's there if only we'll read it. Spend less time watching your news outlet and spend more time reading your, reading your Bible. Spend less time doing things that don't matter and spend more time reading the Word because in this, in reading the Word, we see just how God is faithful to His people. And we get an understanding that in the dark, we hug to the light. In the dark, we need the light. We get an understanding that that, he, that the shepherd constantly guides us and he claims us. His rod and his staff, they come for me because that's a, 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 a testimony to the fact that we belong to the good shepherd. So no matter what happens, we're his. No matter what happens, we're in his care. So whatever the circumstance in your life is today, we can pray, God, give us this day our daily bread because he's gonna do it. It may not look like what you think it's gonna look like, But God gives grace. Paul would say his grace is sufficient. His grace is sufficient for today. And you know what? Tomorrow his grace is going to be sufficient. And the next day his grace is going to be sufficient. So we pray. We pray to the shepherd who leads us. He leads us to the green pastures. But those pastures, those mountain experiences that makes the valleys of life necessary. And there's lessons to be learned in those valleys. Lessons that we can actually trust our Heavenly Father. Lessons that we can pray, God, give us this day our daily bread. And He'll do it. He's faithful to give us what we need. Knowing that He's the only one that can provide it. He provides us for the needs of our life. He gives us breath. He gives us the ability to work. You know, it's easy to to look at our life and think, okay, well, I've I've worked for what I have. I've worked for my money. I've worked for my career. Let me ask you this question. Who gave you breath? Who's protected you so that you can work? Who's given you opportunities? It's our good shepherd. So therefore, even even if we don't feel the tension of need, that doesn't mean the work of the Good Shepherd isn't happening. You know, George Grant, he's an author and a professor. He he says this of prayer, and I I think this is where I, I pray that I live in context of prayer. He says, prayer as the unconscious heart cry in times of distress is the currency of all humanity. That whenever, whenever trials happen, whenever the wheels fall off, we know to pray. He says, but prayer as the deep and committed soul bond in communion with the Almighty God is an exceptionally rare and precious jewel. So church, I, I want to I exhort you I want to encourage you, don't simply wait for these valleys to pray this prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. But 
be in a discipline, develop a discipline of communing with your heavenly Father. Because one, he welcomes you. The fact that the King of kings and the Lord of lords welcomes you, he welcomes your communion, he knows you, and he still likes you. He knows you and he welcomes you, and he knows that you're not perfect. He knows that even, even though we're justified, he knows that we're subject to sin, he knows that we're going to do ignorant things. He knows that we need him. So why do we pretend like we're not going to go to him? Why do we pretend like we don't need him? He knows what we need. And so I want to encourage you, pray frequently to your Heavenly Father because it truly is an exceptionally rare and precious jewel because we get an increasing sense of God's faithfulness to us. So as we close, I, I invite you today to enter in this commu- into, into this communion, this relationship that God wants to have with you. He, he's paid the price to have with you. Uh, I want to invite you, if, if you're here this morning and, and you don't know Jesus, you don't know your Heavenly Father, you don't know, you don't have a relationship with the Shepherd King who is working, who wants to work in your life, I invite you to say yes to Jesus. I invite you to, to receive the gift of salvation that He gives you. And if you're here this morning and you're a follower of Jesus and you've forgotten, You've forgotten that you need him. Man, let's repent and turn back to him because that's where we can find contentment. That's where we find rest. That's where we find soul restoration communion. If you feel like you are tapped out in life, if you feel like you are spent, if you feel like like you can't make it another day, (coughs) can I tell you that your shepherd welcomes you into his presence. And what he does is exactly what David says. As we pray, give us this day our daily bread. He's, God's the one who leads us beside still waters. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He restores your soul. That's the bread that we need. Not the carbohydrates of Olive Garden, but the soul restoration relationship of our Heavenly Father, finding the bread of life in Christ. So let today be the day that you trust in Jesus as the shepherd of your soul. And Christian, let today be the day that you remember what he's done for you. So what we're about to do, we're about to stand and we're about to sing. We're gonna respond to to the word of God. If if you need prayer, there's gonna be men and women here at the front that wanna pray with you, that wanna exhort you to Christ, that wanna share with you what Jesus has done in their life. If you need to respond to the word, let today be that day. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for uh, your goodness to us. We thank you that we can pray prayers like give us this day our daily bread. And we can trust that we pray these prayers to a heavenly father who not only knows about our needs, but Father, you are shepherding us in such a way that you, you meet the needs that we have for your glory, to your glory. And so, Lord, this morning I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that they would come to know you before they leave. Father, I pray that if there's any brother or sister in Christ that has forgotten, that sufficiency is found in you, that everything that we need is found in you. Father, remind us of that truth. Father, daily remind us of that truth as we preach the gospel to ourselves. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship.
that's what we want for our life today and for our church, to simply honor the Lord. And so may today give you opportunity to do that. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for making much of Jesus with us. I pray that as we leave, the Holy Spirit will continue to teach us from God's Word and that uh, God will use you to, to make much of Jesus in your community. So let me pray for us and then we'll be dismissed our Sunday school classes. Uh, Father, we just, uh, again, we thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that you'd be with our people. Father, be with us as a church. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would use us to proclaim the gospel wherever we may be today. Father, give us gospel opportunities, uh, opportunities to make much of Jesus. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.